Yes, so Michael, your testimony, you, you gave this beautiful title for the, your testimony, The Beauty That Broke My Heart. And mm. with this, I'm just passing on the microphone to you. And I'm all ears, as we all are. May the Holy Spirit guide you. And we got a reflection, we got a questions in our hearts, in maybe in our notebooks, and later on after the, the talk, or maybe in, immediately during the talk, you can actually already add your questions to, to the Q&A box. Um, yeah, I will definitely use simply my notepad and uh, write the question. <laughs> Michael, it's all yours. Please okay. Share, share with you. Well, it's always, it's always a, a joy and a grace to be able to share any bit of, you know, what God has done in your life. So I hope that what, what I'm able to share about um, the Lord's healing, especially Our Lady's presence in my life, um, will, will, ha will resonate with all of you as well in some way or another, even though we'll be speaking a lot about art and about beauty. Hopefully you've experienced something like this in your life. So I thought the best way to begin was to begin uh, with St. Paul. I love the letter to the Ephesians. And uh, I thought that maybe we could, we could use um, just a brief portion of the letter of, of the Ephesians as our initial prayer as we kind of enter into this mystery of what God has done, you know. So here we go. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him whom by the power at work within us is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, okay. Um, quick question. Have you ever been awakened by something beautiful, an encounter with something beautiful in your life? I'm not just thinking of um, walking into a museum and seeing a beautiful piece of art, you know, or a beautiful painting. Um, although that could be it. That, that was the case with me. Um, but something maybe of nature, um, just driving on the road out by our house just last evening on the way home from picking up some feed for our animals. I, I, the, the sun was setting on the mountain behind our house and it just overwhelmed me and I, I started to tear, you know. And I couldn't explain it, it just happened. You know, it was just such gratitude. But have you ever had an experience like that, a beauty? You know, maybe seeing an old couple, you know, in their old age and the love that they have in their marriage, you know the birth of a child, et cetera. You know what I mean. Just, if you've experienced something like that, just call it to mind right now, just for a moment. And think about just for a moment what it was that specifically called to you. I want you to be able to hold that in your heart you know, to hold that moment, those kinds of moments in our heart that the Lord in his goodness and his truth and his beauty is speaking into those little moments to show us something of himself. And it can be so different. It's as, a, it's as different for every person as every person is different, that experience of beauty. But I know that every one of us listening, um, participating in tonight has had that experience at some level. And our culture is somewhat aware of beauty, I think, but it mostly misses the point. I think it kind of skims along the surface. Um, we're kind of surrounded by images, almost chased by them. Our phones are like bleeping and blurping in our pockets, you know, where it's, it's like this, we're constantly being um, inundated with um, visual stimulation maybe even glimpses of beauty, but it's so fleeting. 
it becomes almost, um, if I could say like an artifact of beauty, not um, something disposable. Um, I think about modern art in general, you know, what we consider to be modern art. There's something that's completely self-referential about it. What I mean by that is um, the kind of beauty that they're trying to show is so self-referential that only the artist can explain what it means. You know, nobody has any idea what they're looking at. So the beauty is not able to tra is not able to transfer anything other than a color on a on a page or or a you know um, a strange sculpture. But I want to say this tonight: beauty is always more. Beauty is always something that is un constantly unveiling and unraveling itself before us, if we allow it to. And in that way, beauty is, in its ultimate sense, is divine. It's something that is infinite. True beauty is infinite. See, in our, until our modern age, um, the ancient you know, Greeks and Romans and even uh, the early Christians, up until about the time of, of our, yeah, our, our modern age of industrial revolution, we have thought that the, what we call the transcendentals, the truth, good, and beauty, these were the ways that we, the transcendental attributes of God, these are the three ways theologically, philosophically, that we talked about ways of knowing God through truth, good, and beauty. And also that those were in God himself as uh, as infinite qualities, attributes of God. And so beauty was something that could open us up to, some, to even the divine, something way beyond ourselves. So when I say beauty is always more, what I mean by that is that beauty is always higher in some respect than us. It speaks um, more profoundly, you know, like, uh, like deep calling on deep. It's, it's an abyss. And we can get we can get to its root and its meaning layer by layer by layer. And I think some of that is, is happens in prayer and contemplation, but also it's a gift from God. Um, I'm saying all this about the culture as a way of kind of beginning where I started from. I want to say one more thing. Um, I, think you'll, I think you'll find that this resonates. In our culture, we tend to separate things in order to try to understand them. We kind of begin to compartmentalize. Um, we try to explain the world and even God at times, unfortunately, but we try to explain the world through science and, and also just our, our pattern of thinking as, as dividing things into, com like, into uh, separate components. So we, we look at the whole, but we analyze it in components. And so what we're doing is automatically dis disintegrating what we're, what we're seeing. Um, if you've ever been on an art museum tour and you walk into the gallery um, in DC, for instance, and you, and you have somebody who's, who knows everything there is to know about the painting, every, every brush the artist used, the color, the exact color, how they developed the oil paint, what, where they were sitting when they painted it, and they describe all the little components of it, but for some reason, as they're speaking, they're just not getting the whole beauty that they're seeing that you're seeing in front of you. They're just sh they're just telling you about it. Yeah. So you see an image of an art museum. It's the same thing. It's why we have difficulty um, linking together faith and reason, uh, sex and love, marriage and children. And when we begin to to, to take what God has made as a whole beautiful form in front of us. And speaking of anything that you've encountered that was truly beautiful, then we begin to lose something of it. It begins to become an abstraction. There's a, a beautiful quote. It's actually very difficult. It's kind of foreboding. It's a quote by Hans Urs von Balthasar. He was a, one of the favorite theologians of JP2. One of my, he's my, one of my favorites. When he speaks about beauty, he speaks of it as a place of, uh, of us being disarmed a little bit, like us being our first encounter with uh, something 
higher than ourselves. And it's, it's also a place where we can become the most vulnerable and also to be able to speak to God in a way that is from something even more deep and profound than our own thinking, right? So he says this about our culture. No longer loved or fostered by religion, beauty is lifted from its face as a mask and its absence exposes features on that face which threaten to become incomprehensible to man. So beauty that is separated from truth and goodness becomes something almost of a monster to man, something that it can't, that man cannot uh, commune with. We no longer dare to believe in beauty and we make of it a mere appearance. You know, we think of um, images of beauty we see on Cosmo magazine or something. It's something, such a surface level, a mere appearance in order the more easily to dispose of it. So beauty has become something uh, almost commercial to sell products, you know. Um, our situation today shows that beauty demands for itself at least as much courage and decision as truth and goodness. So as much as we strive for truth and goodness, we also must strive for beauty with courage. But beauty will not allow herself to be separated and banned from her two sisters, uh, truth and goodness, without taking them along with her, without taking them along with herself in an act of mysterious vengeance. So if we try to compartmentalize, to try to disintegrate beauty from truth and goodness, what will happen is beauty itself will also disappear. We can be sure that whoever sneers at beauty's name as if she were the ornament of some bourgeois past, whether he admits it or not, can no longer pray and soon will no longer be able to love. So if, we're, if we think of beauty as something that's just prettiness, you know, something that is, uh, like I said, something that is uh, uh, s simply like a, a stimulation for the eye, then, and, and we make it such a passing thing as to be disposable, then we will find that it's so difficult to pray. We'll also find that it's so difficult to really even love. And I, I, I believe that that's true. And it's actually uh, a horrible statement <laughs> in some ways where you feel like, oh, please God, no, you know? But um, so with that, I wanna give you an example. The best example I can think of to illustrate it is pornography. Um, so pornography is a kind of beauty, and I'm saying that in quotation marks, uh, in the sense that you're seeing a human person made in the image of God, but it's without truth. So it's a beauty without truth, and that is a lie. A beauty without truth equals a lie. Again, uh, the, the idea of pornography is to compartmentalize, to disintegrate, to, 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 um, to break into components, into parts, so that you're not seeing the whole person, but you're focused on parts of the person. And even the modern invention, it, it, pornography in its, in its uh, as rampant as it is today, it's really kind of a modern invention. It's something that has come along very specifically with photography and which allows us in a way that never happened in even in the history of art even though you can say there was pornographic images and paintings in the past obviously however you are still seeing the whole person generally in the artwork in modern pornography it is very much training the mind to see parts by 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 zoning in on particular anatomy and that sort of thing, as you know. So I believe that's a really great example, if that makes, hopefully that makes sense, but also that's a great way for me to jump into my story. So um, again, everybody's testimony is a testimony of grace and mercy, you know, and, and I'm, I'm grateful beyond words for how the Lord has carried me along and how I could have fallen way deeper, you know, uh, but in his mercy, he kept me just above, you know, the bottom <laughs> and um, so that I could breathe. But I also want to express this as, as also uh, hope and healing as well. 
Um, when I was a kid, I grew up in Maryland and I had something of, you know, an idyllic childhood. I grew up on a, on a small homestead kind of family. It was, I would say a homestead. It had two houses on it. One was for my grandparents and one was for us. So we lived 50 yards from my parents' house. Um, we were often running around barefoot in the, in the grass. You know, we raised some of our own food. We had an orchard. Um, my parents afforded me so many opportunities with anything you can think of with sports and Cub Scouts and anything you can think of. I, I had a great school, great teachers, great mentors. And I got good grades, you know, all these things. Everything was just so idyllic, you know. And I was really grateful for that life, you know, trying with all my heart to give it to my kids now. Um, but somewhere around, I think around the age of nine, and it, although it might have been around the age of 10, was my first exposure to pornography. And when I was exposed to pornography through um, a friend of mine, and then from that point on, it was easy access. Um, you know, when you're nine or 10 years old, it's not something that you're sexually attracted to. However, it's kind of fascinating and gross. It's, it's all these things all mixed up. And it was also filled with shame for me. So I felt as if I needed to hide it. And I did. <laughs> I hid it very carefully and, and often. And I would often um, change my hiding places all the time so I was never discovered. At least I think I was never discovered. <laughs> um, but you can imagine uh, how this would begin to affect the life and the, the, that integrated life that I was given of the child, how immediately it kind of drove a knife into it, though I didn't know. And so by the time I was about in seventh grade, I would say I was thoroughly addicted. Um, and, and when you're, when you're a young kid and you're thoroughly, you're thoroughly addicted though, you don't really know what that means. What actually happens in you is, uh, the disintegration that's happening in your mind begins to happen also in your heart. And so I began to really, really struggle with self-confidence <laughs> and extreme, you know, shyness, you know, um, I had, very little idea of what it meant to um, to be a, a a young man, you know. Um, and so, what it did for me was, like I said, spoke about before, was it began to train my brain to think of another person in terms of parts, you know, uh, to size people up as soon as I saw them, you know, like that person's fat, that person's ugly, that you know what I mean. You just begin to see the world this way in in a disintegrated way. Um, by the time I was in high school, all of my friends' parents were divorced, all of them. So I was completely convinced that love was not forever, that love was just something that could not be permanent. Um, with all this in mind, you know, into high school and into early college, uh, there's kind of like broken relationship after broken relationship, a lot of heartbreak not understanding myself and then trying to integrate what I was seeing in pornography into my relationships, which you could imagine was obviously not a good idea and ended up in a lot of heartbreak. So this deep uh, shame that I felt about it, uh, I actually kept this hidden from my very best friends. Like my very best friends in high school had no idea that I was looking at this stuff all the time. Um, my very best friends in college, even, even though they probably wouldn't have had a problem with it, <laughs> had no idea. I did feel that much shame about it. Um, and looking back on that, I feel like that's a grace, you know, that there was a grace there that I, I, I knew that something was wrong, but I couldn't identify it. I should say, growing up, we weren't Catholic. I didn't really, I had a little bit of formation in Sunday school, but I never really prayed. And I didn't really know what that was. There was a night um, for my birthday. My, my buddies decided to take me to a, a strip club for my, for my birthday. And 
is the first time and the last time I was ever at one. And we went in and everything happened. And we went back to the, to our uh, apartment and they were going to go out for the rest of the night. And they said, you want to come with us? And I was like, nah, I just, I don't really, I don't really feel like it. And uh, I remember that night I, I sat in my room and I felt so dead inside that it scared me. Like I felt so completely dead. Like there was nothing left in me. Like I was a hot. And it, it was such a bad feeling. <laughs> it was such a bad feeling that I, I knew that I would never do it again. Um, no matter how much peer pressure there was to do it again. Um, but the, the couple years went on and I was in my senior year in college and uh, everybody around me was in a lot of uh, bad relationships. Obviously there was drinking, there was some drug use, that sort of thing. Everything you could imagine in um, college life. So one night after speaking to one of my friends about a, a personal issue that happened to him regarding his relationship, I was laying in my bed and I was staring at the ceiling and I think it was my first heartfelt prayer in my entire life. But I began to weep and cry and I began just to say to the sky, to the ceiling, I didn't know who I was talking to. What is this all about? You know, who am I? Am I really as alone as I think that I am, that I feel that I am? You know, is, are you listening? God, is there a God? And whether it was a couple days later or a week later, it was close to that. I decided to go to the Ringling Museum. I was at art school at Ringling School of Art and Design in Sarasota, Florida. And down the road from us was the, the Museum of John Ringling, the, the man who started the circus, the American circus. He was a great art, art collector. And he created this museum that was, that was um, uh, very uh, European in its look. And it had tons of Rubens paintings, I think a couple of Rembrandt paintings, and uh, just masters of, um, of, uh, of, of that time period, even some Baroque works. I think you're going to see some pictures, yeah. So you get a sense of, of what the museum is like. You know, it's just sort of jaw-dropping, beautiful, you know, European-style art museum. And I was wandering through there as I had done so many times before with my uh, sketchbook just to, just to draw something, just to sit and draw. And uh, I stumbled across an image of Our Lady. The image was, it's called the Blue Madonna. It's uh, by an Italian priest by the name of Carlo uh, Dolce. Um, at a young age, he, uh, he decided that he only wanted to paint uh, religious images, and he did. Uh, I think this is his best work. I'm actually not really attracted to any of his other paintings, <laughs> but this painting, I stopped in front of this painting. It just, it's about uh, 12 by 16. It's not that big. And the image on your screen does not do it justice, but the blue in the veil is almost like you can stick your fingers into it. It's like, a, it's almost alive. I've never seen a pigment like that on a canvas before. It's like a, it's like a blue I've never seen. I can't even describe, I have no idea how he even made it. But I stopped in front of the image and it stunned me. Like I felt a shock up my, up my spine almost. And I sat down on the bench in front of it. And I just stared at this image. I knew who it was. I knew it was a picture of the Blessed Virgin. I had no relationship with her, not being Catholic. And I began to really cry. And I don't know if you've ever cried like a really ugly cry before, like with the like snot and everything coming down and stuff, but it was like an uncontrollable sobbing cry. It was like all the pain of my life just came gushing out of me, literally and figuratively. I could have said it to you right then if you were sitting next to me. I knew and I thought for some, that this image of this woman was the most beautiful picture of a woman I'd ever seen in my life. After you know, more than a decade and a half of a lot of pornography and bad relationships, I was looking at the most beautiful 
picture of a woman I'd ever seen in my entire life. And I wept like I have not wept really since in my life. I stayed there for a couple of hours and just looked at her. I didn't say anything. I just looked. And I, before I left, I went to the, to the gift shop and I asked them if they had a print and they dug out a print that they had there and I bought it right on the spot and brought it back to my apartment. And to kind of hide it from my friends because I was embarrassed again, you know, I you know, have a picture of the Virgin Mary in your, <laughs> in your fraternity apartment room, you know, um, is maybe not as cool. So I, I decided I put her on the inside of my, my door. And there she was, just amidst the rest of my mess, my day to day. And gradually, gradually, I began to feel like I really wanted to go to church. And so for some reason, again, a mystery of grace. I felt like I wanted to go to a Catholic church. I'd never been in my life. And so I went to a Sunday mass by myself and kind of snuck in and went up to the choir loft. Not sure what was going to happen. And I just watched. And that's when the Lord really began to speak to me in ways that I didn't know were possible. Why Our Lady? Why... <laughs> The one thing I've learned about Our Lady through all this is that she's not afraid of our junk. There's not a single thing that she is afraid of going with us into. Um, I'm convinced that she was with me in the strip club. I know that might sound strange, but I'm convinced by, by not only the way I felt afterwards, um, but that there was, a, there was a mystery of grace that was coming through her hands, even then. Um, why Our Lady? Our Lady is the highest level of created beauty. You know, God created this woman sinless. You know? So she's the highest level of creative beauty, the most like us, you know, Jesus is, you know, also a divine person. Our lady was not, is not, but is the highest level of creative beauty. Dante in, um, um, talks about her in the, in the splendors of paradise. He says that our lady's beauty was the beauty that was the joy in the eyes of all the other saints. So the beauty of Our Lady, the beauty that was joy in the eyes of all the other saints, her beauty. So really, <laughs> after all that had happened in my life, in my young life, and up until that moment, it ended up being the beauty of woman, the beauty of the woman that broke my heart that broke my heart open to be able to receive God. And my heart was broken open with all those tears, you know, to receive God and, uh, and, and to, to be healed from all that, to be healed from uh, pornography addiction, to, be he to begin to be restored in my mind, that I could begin to see not only myself, which was super important, but others, all of creation, with a more integrated gaze, you know, I'm still, I'm still getting there. I have, you know, it's frustrating as an artist sometimes to be, when you, you see something, you're, you're looking at something beautiful, but you know, you're not seeing it all, you know, um, and you know, you're not able to capture it all, no matter what you do. Um, I'm still praying for the full integration of all that, you know, um, I, just, I guess I'll, I'll end this portion of the night with just a quote of John Paul II. It's, it's from the end of his letter to artists, which is my very favorite document in the world. Um, he says that beauty is a key to the mystery and a call to transcendence. I'll say that again. Beauty is a key to the mystery and a call to transcendence, call for us to go beyond ourselves. It is an invitation to savor life and to dream of the future. That is why 
the beauty of created things can never fully satisfy. So if we get stuck in what I was saying before, the beauty of, of a kind of um, surface, surfacey beauty, or even the beauty, if, if we can even grasp, if, if we could grasp the full beauty of the creation around us and of the people in front of us, it would still not be enough for us, is what John Paul II is saying. And that's a lot to stay. <laughs> I mean, if we could really grasp the beauty of creation and of, I think we would probably die just from that, but that's still not enough for us to satisfy us. And it stirs that. So he says it stirs the hidden nostalgia for God that we have, which a lover of beauty uh, we're called to be. It stirs the hidden nostalgia we have for God to go back to him, to, to be with him forever. And so he, he ends the document with St. Augustine late. Have I loved you? Beauty ever ancient, ever new. Late have I loved you. So uh, with that, I just pray for all of you that um, that if you've ever that you would have an experience of beauty that bowls you over, you know, that opens your heart to the mystery of God, and and that you would come uh, to be more yourself.